welcome to the Saving Castles podcast, the sanctuary for castle devotees and medieval history enthusiasts. Prepare to embark on a thrilling voyage through time as we unveil enthralling history and legend. From ancient folklore to cutting-edge restoration, we've got it all covered. So grab your headphones and let's dive right in. Welcome, dear listeners, to a journey through the misty corridors of time, where the ocean's roar echoes against ancient castle walls and black flags ripple like shadows over the old world. Today, we travel into the obscure annals of history to resurrect the tales of Europe's forgotten pirate kings, those enigmatic figures who once ruled the seas and left their mark on the lands they plundered. Imagine, if you will, a world vastly different from our own. It's a time when Europe is a patchwork of kingdoms and empires, each vying for dominance over land and sea. In this age of exploration and conquest, the sea is not just a vast expanse of water, but a stage upon which the drama of human ambition, greed and revenge unfold. Here, amidst the turbulent waves, emerge figures who are as much a product of their time as they are shapers of their own destiny, pirate kings and queens, ruling not from thrones, but from the decks of their formidable ships. These are not the pirates of popular law. They are not mere caricatures sporting eye patches and parrots. These are real flesh and blood characters, complex and compelling. They are noble born and commoner alike, drawn to the pirate's life for reasons as varied as their backgrounds. Some seek revenge against those who wronged them. Others are driven by sheer survival and a few, perhaps, by the thrill of defying the world's mightiest navies. In our first segment, we introduce Captain Arturo Doria, a figure born of Italian nobility in the 15th century. Arturo's story is one of dramatic transformation, from a noble to a feared corsair of the Mediterranean. His journey begins with the loss of his ancestral home, a castle that stood as a symbol of his family's power and prestige. Betrayed and bereft of his heritage, Artur turns to the sea, finding in its endless horizons a path to retribution. His raids along the Mediterranean are not mere acts of piracy. They are a campaign of vengeance, each conquest a strike against those who stripped him of his birthright. Then we sail north to the icy waters of the North Sea, where we encounter Sven Gablebart, a Viking pirate whose name struck fear in the hearts of 11th century sailors. Sen, Sega, is one of relentless conquest. His longships are scourge upon the coasts of England and beyond. His fortress, hidden among the Danish Isles, becomes a legend. A bastion of pirate power in a sea of kingdoms. But Sven's tale is not just one of pillage and plunder. It is a story of a changing world, where the old ways of the Viking clash with the emerging powers of medieval Europe. In the Adriatic we find Tota, the Illyrian pirate queen of the 3rd century BC, whose very existence challenges our understanding of history. A woman of extraordinary power in a male-dominated era, Tota commands fleets and defies empires. Her struggle against Roman expansion is not just a battle for territory. It is a fight for the survival of her people and their way of life. From her hidden fortress on the Dalmatian coast, Tuta watches over a sea that is both her domain and her battleground. Each of these stories, and the others that follow, are threads in a tapestry as rich and complex as the era they depict. They are tales of adventure, yes, but also of identity, power, and resistance. Through them, we glimpse a world where the line between hero and villain is often blurred, where the sea is both a perilous wilderness and a road to glory. So, dear listeners, as we embark on this voyage through history, let us cast off the moorings of the present and set sail into the past. Let us explore the lives of those who dared to defy kings and emperors, who sought freedom on the open sea, and who, in doing so, wrote their own chapters in the annals of history. These are the stories of Europe's forgotten pirate kings and queens and they await us, like hidden treasures, in the depths of time. In the heart of the 15th century, when Europe was a mosaic of burgeoning kingdoms and duchies, there emerged from the shadows of Italian nobility a figure destined 
to become a legend of the Mediterranean Sea. This is the story of Captain Arturo Doria, the corsair of Calabria, whose life was a tapestry woven with threads of nobility, betrayal and vengeance upon the high seas. Born into the illustrious Doria family of Genoa, Arturo was the scion of an ancient lineage with ancestral roots deeply embedded in the fertile soil of Italian aristocracy. His early life was set against the backdrop of a grand castle that stood as a testament to his family's power and prestige. Within its stone walls, young Arturo learned the art of swordsmanship and the subtleties of court politics. However, it was the boundless sea, visible from the highest towers of his castle, that called to him whispering promises of adventure and freedom. His world was shattered when a rival faction, envious of the Doria family's influence, orchestrated a cunning plot. In a night of treachery, his family castle was besieged and captured, his kin slain or scattered. Arturo, barely escaping with his life, found himself a noble without a home, a prince without a throne. The sea, once a beckoning horizon, became his refuge and the stage upon which he would exact his revenge. Adopting the life of a corsair, Arturo Doria transformed his grief and rage into a fearsome resolve. He gathered a loyal crew of outcasts and renegades, men who saw in him not just a leader, but a symbol of defiance against the powers that had wronged them. Together, they stole a ship, christening it La Vendetta, the Vengeance, and raised above it a black flag emblazoned with the Doria family crest, a haunting reminder of the noble house that once was. Captain Doria and his crew set sail across the Mediterranean, targeting the ships and coastal holdings of those who had conspired against his family. With each daring raid, Arturo's legend grew. He was no ordinary pirate. He was a fallen noble, a corsair of Calabria, seeking justice on a sea that had witnessed the rise and fall of empires. Arturo's mastery of naval warfare was unmatched. He maneuvered La Vendetta through tempests and calm, alike with a navigator's precision and a tactician's cunning. His knowledge of the secret coves and hidden harbors along the Italian coast allowed him to strike unexpectedly and vanish like a ghost, leaving only the echoes of his crew's battle cries and the flames of burning ships in his wake. Yet amidst the violence and chaos of his crusade, there was an enigmatic grace to Captain Doria. He was known to spare those who surrendered and was even generous to the poor and downtrodden in the ports he visited. In their eyes he was not a pirate but a hero, a champion of the oppressed, a noble spirit who had turned his personal tragedy into a war against injustice. As years passed, the corsair of Calabria became a figure of myth and legend. Stories of his exploits were whispered in taverns and sung in ballads. He was both revered and feared, a ghostly prince upon the waves, a spectre of retribution in a world where the lines between noble and pirate, justice and vengeance, were as fluid as the sea itself. Captain Arturo Doria's final fate remains shrouded in mystery. Some say he reclaimed his family's castle and died a nobleman, others that he vanished into the sea's embrace, his spirit forever sailing the waters of the Mediterranean. But what remains certain is the legacy he left behind, a testament to the indomitable human spirit, a reminder that even in our darkest hours there is a light that cannot be extinguished, a flame that burns fiercely in the heart of those who dare to challenge their fate. In the annals of history, Captain Arturo Doria stands not merely as a pirate or a noble, but as an emblem of the eternal struggle against tyranny and oppression a symbol of the undying quest for justice and honour. In the dark, tumultuous waters of the North Sea, during the era when the Viking longships were the scourge of the coasts, there emerged a figure as formidable as the Norse gods of old. Sven Gablebart, the Danish dragon, his story woven into the fabric of the 11th century, is a saga of power, conquest and legendary maritime prowess. He was born in a land carved by the fierce winds and relentless tides of Denmark. From a young age, he was steeped in the sagas of his ancestors, warriors and explorers who had traversed the seas to distant lands. 
As he grew, so too did his reputation. Sven was not just a warrior. He was a leader who could inspire with a word and command with a glance. Under his guidance, his band of followers grew into a formidable force and soon, the name Sven Gable Bart was whispered in fear along the coastlines of England and beyond. His long ship, sleek and swift, were like shadows on the water, striking with the ferocity of a winter storm and disappearing into the mists before any defence could be mounted. His fortress, a bastion of strength and resilience, stood proudly on the Danish Isles. It was more than just a stronghold. It was a symbol of his unyielding will and authority. From this fortress he planned his raids, gathering his fleet to strike out at the kingdoms that lay across the sea. His targets were not chosen at random. Each was a carefully calculated move in a larger game of power and dominance. The siege of English coastal castles became a hallmark of Sven's campaigns. These were not just military endeavours. They were psychological warfare. Sven understood the terror that his arrival would instigate, and he used it as a weapon just as effectively as his sword. His longships bearing the dragon's head would emerge from the fog a nightmarish vision to those who stood upon the castle walls. But Sven Saga was not solely one of conquest and fear. He was a ruler who understood the importance of loyalty and respect. His men followed him not out of dread, but out of genuine admiration and allegiance. In Sven, they saw not just a leader, but a symbol of their own aspirations and desires. He embodied the Viking spirit, fearless, free and boundless, the legendary battle against King Ethelred's fleet stands as a testament to Sven's strategic genius and warrior spirit. It was not merely a clash of ships and swords. It was a battle of wills. The English fleet, bolstered by desperation and the need to protect their homeland, faced the Danish dragon and his marauders in a confrontation that would echo through history. The sea turned into a churning cauldron of chaos and fury, as the two forces collided in a maelstrom of steel and salt. The tales of Sven Gabelbart's exploits traversed beyond the seas he conquered. They were sung in mead halls and whispered in the chambers of kings and queens. Sven became a legend, a figure larger than life, embodying the fearsome reputation of the Viking raiders. Yet within these stories, there was also a sense of awe and respect for a man who, through sheer force of will and strength of arm, carved his name into the very fabric of history. As with many legendary figures, the end of his saga is shrouded in mystery. Some say he perished at sea, others that he retired to his fortress, living out his days in the land he loved. What remains, however, is the legacy of the Danish dragon, a legacy of bravery, strategy, and an unquenchable thirst for glory. In the chronicles of Europe's forgotten pirate kings, Sven Gabelbart stands as a towering figure, a reminder of an age when the sea was a highway for the bold, and the greatest of men were those who dared to sail its treacherous waters. In an age where the tapestry of history was woven predominantly by the deeds of men, there emerged from the shadows of the Adriatic a figure who would challenge the very foundations of this male-dominated narrative. This is the tale of Tuta, the Illyrian pirate queen, a woman whose name became synonymous with the untamed spirit of the sea and whose reign marked a turbulent yet fascinating chapter in the ancient world. Tuta's story begins in the 3rd century BC, in the rugged mountainous terrain of Illyria, a region known today as the Balkans. In a society where women were often relegated to the margins of history, Tuta rose to power following the death of her husband, King Agron. She ascended not as a mere figurehead, but as a sovereign in her own right, commanding respect and fear in equal measure. Her kingdom, perched on the edge of the Adriatic Sea, was a land of fierce warriors and skilled seafarers. The Illyrians had long been known for their naval prowess, and under Queen Tuta's rule, they reached new heights of maritime dominance. She recognized the strategic importance of the sea as a conduit for trade and a pathway for conquest. With a fleet at her command, Tuta unleashed her pirate ships upon the rich cargo vessels traversing the Adriatic and Ionian seas, seizing goods and asserting her authority over the maritime trade routes. 
Queen Tuta's pirates were not mere brigands. They were agents of a state policy designed to control the economic lifelines of the region. Her ships, agile and swift, struck with precision and ferocity, instilling fear in the hearts of merchants and rival states alike. The Adriatic Sea, under her rule, became a realm where Illyrian sails were the uncontested masters. But Tuta's ambitions extended beyond piracy and economic dominance. She found herself at the heart of a geopolitical struggle as the burgeoning power of Rome sought to expand its influence across the Mediterranean. The Roman Republic, wary of Tuta's growing power, dispatched emissaries to negotiate an end to the piracy that plagued their trade routes. Tuta, however, was not one to be easily intimidated. In a bold affront to Roman dignity, she asserted that piracy was not against the laws of her people, essentially challenging Rome's authority. This defiance marked a turning point in Tuta's reign and set the stage for a conflict that would have far-reaching consequences. The Romans, outraged by her audacity, declared war on Illyria. The ensuing conflict, known as the First Illyrian War, saw Tuta's forces pitted against the might of Rome. Despite her valiant efforts and the prowess of her navy, the sheer scale of the Roman military machine began to turn the tide against her. Tuta's stronghold, a hidden fortress nestled at the Dalmatian coast, became a final bastion against Roman encroachment. The fortress, reputedly impregnable, stood as a symbol of Illyrian resilience and defiance. From its towering walls, Tuta orchestrated her defence, her spirit unbroken even in the face of overwhelming odds. In the end, the might of Rome proved too great. Tuta was forced to negotiate a peace that saw her seedy control of much of her maritime empire. Yet even in defeat, her legacy endured. She had stood toe-to-toe with one of the greatest powers of the ancient world and had left an indelible mark on history. Queen Tuta's story is more than a tale of piracy and power. It is a narrative of resistance against the tides of conquest and subjugation. Her life serves as a testament to the often overlooked role of women in shaping the course of history. In a world dominated by the deeds of men, Tuta, shown as a beacon of female strength and sovereignty. Today, the echoes of her legacy still linger in the winds that sweep across the Adriatic, a reminder of a time when an Illyrian queen defied empires and ruled the waves. In the annals of the forgotten pirate kings, few figures are as enigmatic and cunning as Gottfried the Wily, the Saxon marauder whose shadow loomed over the Baltic Sea in the 9th century. His story, set against the backdrop of a fractious Europe where the old world was giving way to the new, is a tapestry of intrigue, strategy and maritime mastery. Gottfried's origins are shrouded in the mists of the early medieval period, a time when Saxony was a land caught in the throes of change and conflict. Born into a minor noble family, Gottfried's early life was marked by the turbulence of his times. The Saxons, a fiercely independent people, were facing increasing pressure from the expanding Carolingian Empire. It was in this crucible of political upheaval that Gottfried's destiny was forged. From a young age, he displayed a sharp intellect and a cunning that belied his noble birth. He was not content with the traditional pursuits of his class. Instead, he was drawn to the allure of the sea, where power was not dictated by lineage but by skill and daring. Gottfried saw in the tumultuous waters of the Baltic not a barrier, but a pathway to greatness. As he grew into manhood, Gottfried became a master of both land and sea. He forged a band of loyal followers, men who were drawn to his charismatic leadership and strategic mind. Together they embarked on a bold endeavour to carve out their own kingdom in the Baltic, a kingdom that would be free from the yoke of the Carolingian lords. Gottfried's base of operations was the fabled island of Rugen, located off the Pomeranian coast. Here, he built his fortress. A stronghold was as much a statement of defiance as it was a bastion of security. The castle, with its towering walls and imposing battlements, stood as a challenge to anyone who dared contest his dominion over the Baltic waters. 
The Saxon marauder, as he came to be known, was not a pirate in the common sense of the word. He was a tactician, a chess player who viewed the sea as his board and ships as his pieces. His raids were not mere acts of pillage. They were carefully orchestrated manoeuvres designed to outwit his adversaries and expand his influence. Gottfried's ships, sleek and fast, were marvels of naval engineering. They were equipped with innovations that were ahead of their time, enabling them to navigate the treacherous waters of the Baltic with ease. Under Gottfried's command, these ships struck swiftly and vanished like phantoms, leaving his enemies bewildered and infuriated. But Gottfried's true genius lay in his ability to play the political game. He was a master of diplomacy, forging alliances with other pirate lords and even engaging in negotiations with the very powers he defied. He understood that true power was not just one with the sword, but also with words and cunning. The tales of Gottfried the Wily's exploits became the stuff of legend, whispered in awe and fear from the shores of Saxony to the halls of Ayakon. He was a shadow figure, a ghost on the waves, a reminder that even the mightiest empires could be challenged by a single determined mind. In the end, the fate of Gottfried the Wily, like that of so many legendary figures, is lost to the mists of time. Some say he died in battle, his ship going down with flags flying. Others that he vanished, his final fate a mystery wrapped in an enigma. But what remains is the legacy of a man who, in an era of kings and emperors, dared to carve his own path, a marauder who became a king in all but name. In the saga of Europe's forgotten pirate kings, Gottfried the Wily stands as a testament to the enduring human spirit, a symbol of the cunning and resilience required to survive and thrive in an age of darkness and uncertainty. In the annals of piracy, few stories are as poignant and potent as that of Jeanne de Clisson, the Breton buccaneer, whose life in the 14th century was a tapestry of love, loss, and a relentless quest for vengeance upon the high seas. Her tale is not just a chronicle of piracy. It is a saga of a heartbroken widow who transformed her sorrow into a fearsome crusade against the French crown. Jeanne de Clisson's story begins in the verdant landscapes of Brittany, where she was born into nobility. Her life, initially marked by the typical trappings of medieval aristocracy, took a dramatic turn following her marriage to Olivia de Clisson, a respected Breton lord. Their life together was one of contentment, marked by the joys of family and the duties of nobility. However, the winds of fate were soon to change direction, casting her into a tempest of betrayal and retribution. In 1343, during the tumultuous times of the Hundred Years' War between England and France, Olivia was accused of treachery by the French king, Philip VI. Despite scant evidence and Olivia's protestations of loyalty, he was summarily executed, his head sent to Nantes as a grim warning to others. This act of ruthless injustice shattered Jeanne's world, turning her grief into a burning desire for vengeance against the king who had wronged her family so grievously. Jeanne sold her lands and raised a small fleet of ships. These were not the vessels of trade or transport. They were instruments of war, painted black and emblazoned with crimson sails, a symbol of the blood she intended to spill in her quest for vengeance. The sea once a boundary became her realm, where she could unleash her fury against the agents of the French crown she now became known as the Lioness of Brittany, transformed into a pirate unlike any other. Her targets were the ships of the French nobility and the merchant vessels that supported the French regime. With a keen strategic mind and a warrior's heart, Jean led her crew in daring raids, striking fear into the hearts of sailors and soldiers alike. The Castle of Clisson, once her home and a symbol of her family's legacy, became a distant memory, replaced by the deck of her flagship named My Revenge. From here, John commanded her fleet with a combination of maternal care and ruthless efficiency. Her crew, a mix of seasoned sailors and loyal supporters, followed her not out of fear, but out of respect and shared purpose. They were not just pirates. They were avengers fighting under the banner of a woman who had lost everything to the cruelty of a king.
Her exploits on the high seas became legendary. She was a spectre haunting the French crown, a reminder of the brutal cost of injustice. Her relentless attacks not only disrupted French supply lines, but also sent a powerful message to the king that the fury of a wronged woman knows no bound. For years, Jeanne waged her private war, her name whispered in awe and fear in the courts of Europe. Yet, despite her ferocity and the toll she exacted upon the French, there was an underlying sense of honour in her actions. She was known to spare those who surrendered and treated her prisoners with a degree of respect uncommon in that brutal age. The saga of Jean de Clisson, the Breton buccaneer, is more than a tale of piracy. It is a story of a woman's indomitable spirit in the face of unimaginable loss. Her life serves as a testament to the enduring themes of love, betrayal and vengeance that have shaped human history. In the annals of Europe's forgotten pirate kings and queens, her story stands unique, a powerful reminder that the sea does not distinguish between man and woman, noble and commoner. On its waves, all are equal, and all have the potential to shape their own destiny. In the turbulent waters of Scottish history, amidst the wars and whispers of kings and queens, emerges the formidable figure of Sir Andrew Wood of Largo, known as the Scottish Sea Wolf. His life in the late 15th century, a period rife with conflict and change, epitomizes the complex interplay of loyalty, warfare, and maritime prowess. Born to a seafaring family in the small village of Largo in Fife, Andrew Wood's destiny was inextricably linked to the sea from the beginning, to the rugged coastlines of Scotland battered by the North Sea were a constant backdrop to his youth, where he learned to navigate both the treacherous waters and the equally perilous realms of Scottish politics. Andrew's early life was marked by the tumultuous struggles of Scotland against English aggression. The long-standing enmity between the two kingdoms provided a fertile ground for his ascent demonstrating an exceptional understanding of naval tactics and a natural leadership ability, Wood quickly rose to prominence, earning the attention and favour of King James III of Scotland. Wood's most renowned ships, the Flower and the Yellow Carvel, became symbols of his maritime dominance. These ships, equipped with the latest naval technology of the time, were not just vessels of war. They were embodiments of Scottish resilience and ingenuity. Under Wood's command, they patrolled the Scottish waters safeguarding merchant vessels and repelling English privateers. The Scottish Sea Wolf's reputation was solidified through a series of daring encounters with English ships. His most legendary battle took place in the Firth of Forth, where Wood, with his two ships, faced off against a squadron of five English warships. The battle fought with a combination of strategic brilliance and raw courage, ended in a stunning victory for Wood. His success was not just a personal triumph, but a beacon of hope for a Scotland beleaguered by external threats. Sir Andrew Wood's exploits at sea were matched by his savvy in the court. He skillfully navigated the shifting allegiances and power struggles that characterised the Scottish nobility. His loyalty to the crown, unwavering and steadfast, earned him titles and lands, including the estate at Largo Bay, where he built his castle, a fortress that mirrored his strength and determination. The castle at Largo Bay was more than a noble residence. It was a testament to Wood's journey from a seafarer to a laird. Its walls, standing tall and proud, were a reflection of its master's indomitable spirit. From its towers, Wood could gaze upon the sea, the eternal companion of his adventures and struggles. Yet, for all his military prowess and noble standing, Andrew Wood was not a man of war alone. He was known for his fairness and his efforts to protect Scotland's maritime trade. He emerged as a patron of the arts and a supporter of maritime advancements, contributing to Scotland's naval heritage. Wood's life, however, was not without its trials. The shifting tides of politics and the ascendancy of James the Fourth brought new challenges and allegiances. Yet, through it all, Andrew Wood remained a figure of unwavering loyalty and integrity, his name synonymous with the maritime defence of his homeland. The legend of Sir Andrew Wood, the Scottish Sea Wall, is a compelling chapter in the story of Scotland's fight for sovereignty 
and the saga of Europe's forgotten maritime heroes. His legacy is not just in the battles he won or the titles he earned, but in the enduring image of a man who stood as a guardian of his nation's waters, a symbol of the courage and resilience of the Scottish people. In the tapestry of maritime history, Andrew Wood of Largo stands tall, a reminder that the true measure of a hero is not just in the might of his sword, but in the strength of his character and the depth of his commitment to his land and people. In the shadowy waters of the Baltic Sea, during the waning years of the 14th century, a legend was forged that would echo through the annals of maritime history. This is the tale of Klaus Storterbecker, the Hansatic raider, a man whose name became a byword for piracy, rebellion, and defiance in the face of overwhelming power. Klaus Storterbecker, whose moniker Storterbecker suggests down the beaker in one gulps in German, a nod to his legendary drinking prowess, was more than just a pirate. He was a symbol of resistance against the might and avarice of the Hansetic League. The League, a powerful confederation of merchant guilds and market towns in northwestern and central Europe, had monopolized trade in the Baltic and North Sea, wielding economic power that rivaled that of empires. Born in the port city of Wismer, Stortebecker's early life remains shrouded in mystery, much like the foggy shores of the Baltic. However, it is believed that his journey to piracy began not out of a mere thirst for riches, but as a response to the harsh and often unfair practices of the Hanseatic League. He saw in piracy not just a means of survival, but also a form of protest, a way to challenge the status quo that had left many seafarers and towns at the mercy of the League's greed. Stortebecker's infamy began with the formation of the Victualler Brothers, a group of privateers initially hired by the Duchy of Mecklenburg to fight against Denmark. However, with the end of this conflict, the Victual Brothers, under Stortebecker's leadership, turned to piracy. Their targets were the richly laden merchant ships of the Hanseatic League, symbols of the very power structure they sought to undermine. The fortress on the island of Gotland, especially the town of Visby, became Stortebecker's stronghold. From this strategic position, he could control the trade routes of the Baltic Sea. The fortress was not just a lair for pirates. It was a statement of defiance, a bastion of freedom in a sea controlled by merchants and monarchs. Stortebecker's raids were legendary, not just for their frequency and ferocity, but also for their precision and effectiveness. His fleet, a formidable force of swift ships, struck fear into the hearts of Hanseatic sailors. They were phantoms of the Baltic, appearing from nowhere, their black flags an ominous portent of the mayhem that was to follow. But Klaus Stortebecker was more than just a raider. He was a leader who commanded unwavering loyalty from his men. He was known for his fairness and his willingness to share the spoils of his raids equitably, a rare quality in an era where greed often overruled camaraderie. This sense of justice earned him the respect and admiration of not only his crew, but also of the common folk, who saw in him a hero fighting against a corrupt and oppressive system. The legend of Stortebecker took a dramatic turn with his capture. The details of his capture are as murky as the waters of the Baltic, but it is said that treachery played a part. Stortebecker and his crew were brought to Hamburg, where they were sentenced to death. In a final act of defiance, Stortebecker is said to have made a bold request, that he be granted the lives of as many of his men as he could walk past after being beheaded. The legend tells that he managed to walk past eleven of his men before the executioner tripped him, an act to display both his strength and the treachery of his captors. Klaus Stortebecker's death marked the end of an era in the history of piracy in the Baltic, he was immortalized not just as a pirate, but as a folk hero, a symbol of resistance against the tyranny of economic oppression. His legacy continues to inspire. A reminder that in the turbulent seas of history, there are those who refuse to bow down to power, who choose instead to carve their own path, even in the face of insurmountable odds. In the tapestry of Europe's forgotten pirate kings, Klaus Stortebecker stands tall, your raider, a rebel and a legend whose story 
continues to captivate the imagination of all who yearn for freedom and justice on the high seas. In the annals of piracy, few names strike as much awe and fear as Barbarossa, the Mediterranean terror. His saga, set in the turbulent waters of the 16th century, is a tale not just of piracy, but of empire building, of the clash of civilizations, and the relentless pursuit of power and dominance. Born as Kizza on the island of Lesbos in the early 1470s, Barbarossa was the son of a former Janissary and a Greek mother. His path to infamy began alongside his brother, Orukreis, who was also a feared pirate. Together, they forged a reputation as formidable sea raiders. But it was under Barbarossa's leadership that their legacy reached its zenith. The Mediterranean during the 16th century was a chessboard of competing powers, with the Ottoman Empire and various European states vying for control. In this volatile milieu, Barbarossa saw an opportunity not just to ply the pirate's trade, but to carve out a kingdom of his own. His initial exploits as a pirate were marked by audacious raids on merchant ships and coastal towns, rapidly growing his wealth. Barbarossa's rise to power took a significant turn when he captured the fortress of Algiers in 1516. This was more than a mere act of piracy. It was a strategic move that gave him a base from which to control the western Mediterranean. Under his command, it became a haven for pirates and a thorn in the side of European powers, particularly Spain, which had vast territories and interests in the region. The transformation of Barbarossa from pirate to ruler was cemented when he pledged allegiance to the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent. Recognizing his naval prowess and the strategic importance of his position in Algiers, the Sultan appointed him as the Admiral of the Ottoman fleet. This alliance shifted Barbarossa's role from a rogue pirate to a key player in the geopolitical struggles of the era. As the Admiral of the Ottoman fleet, Barbarossa led numerous naval campaigns that reshaped the balance of power in the Mediterranean. His most notable achievement was the victory at the Battle of Previsa in 1538, where he decisively defeated a Holy League fleet of the papacy, Spain, Venice, and other states. This battle established the Ottoman Empire as a dominant maritime force in the Mediterranean and solidified Barbarossa's reputation as a brilliant naval commander. Barbarossa was not just a military tactician. He was also a skilled administrator and a shrewd politician. He fortified the defences of Algiers and other key ports, turning them into impregnable bases that would secure Ottoman control over the Mediterranean for decades. His governance brought a measure of stability and prosperity to the region as he balanced his aggressive expansion with periods of peace and diplomacy. Despite his allegiance to the Ottoman Empire, Barbarossa never lost the independent spirit that had marked his early days as a pirate. He continued to command his fleet with a blend of ruthlessness and cunning, always keeping his enemies guessing his next move. His red beard, from which his nickname Barbarossa was derived, became a symbol of terror and respect across the Mediterranean. Barbarossa's legacy extends beyond his military and naval achievements. He left an indelible mark on the history of the Mediterranean, symbolizing the era's complex interplay of piracy, politics, and power. His life story is a testament to the transformative power of ambition and skill, and his name remains synonymous with the age of corsairs and empires. In the narrative of Europe's forgotten pirate kings, Barbarossa stands as a towering figure, a reminder of a time when the Mediterranean was a battleground of empires and the sea a canvas for the ambitions of remarkable individuals. In the turbulent waters of 16th century Ireland, amidst the political upheavals and clashing empires, a figure rises from the mists of the Atlantic, Grace O'Malley, the Irish rover. Her life is a saga woven from the threads of rebellion, resilience, and the relentless pursuit of autonomy, both for herself and for her people. Grace O'Malley, known as Grainy Maol in Irish, was born in 1530 to the O'Malley clan, a noble family in the west of Ireland with a long tradition of seafaring. From the craggy shores of Connacht, 
Her world was one where the land and sea were inextricably linked, a frontier of rocky coasts and rolling waves where survival depended on mastery of the sea. As a child, Grace was enamored with the sea and the tales of her family's exploits upon it. Legend has it that, as a young girl, she cut off her hair to disguise herself as a boy just to be on her father's ship, earning her the nickname Bald Grace. This act of defiance set the stage for a life that would defy the conventions of her time. Grace's marriage to Donald O'Flaherty, a chieftain of a neighboring clan, brought her into the world of clan politics and warfare. However, it was her response to Donald's death, rather than the marriage itself, that marked her scent as a leader and warrior. Refusing to succumb to the traditional role of a widow, Grace took control of her husband's fleet and followers, asserting her place in a world dominated by men. Under her command, the O'Malley fleet became a formidable force, controlling the shipping lanes off the west coast of Ireland. Grace's ships were not just instruments of trade, they were tools of power and independence. She engaged in what was termed as maintenance by land and sea, demanding tribute from those who traversed her waters and defending her territory from rival clans and English encroachment. Grace's stronghold was Rockfleet Castle, located on the shores of Clue Bay. This castle was more than a mere residence. It was a strategic outpost, a symbol of her strength and status. From here, she could survey her domain, a queen in all but name, her authority derived from her maritime prowess and the loyalty of her followers. The most remarkable aspect of Grace's story is her audacious meeting with Queen Elizabeth I. In 1593, facing increasing challenges to her power and territory, Grace sought an audience with the English Queen. The meeting of these two formidable women, each a ruler in her own right, is the stuff of legend. Grace, refusing to bow to Elizabeth as a subject, negotiated as an equal, seeking the release of her family members and the recognition of her rights and lands. This meeting was not just a personal triumph for Grace, but a symbol of her political savvy and courage. She navigated the complex politics of English rule, maintaining her independence while securing concessions from a monarch whose empire was encroaching on Irish sovereignty. Grace O'Malley's life after her meeting with Elizabeth is less documented, but it is believed that she continued to be active in the defence and management of the lands and seas until her death in 1603. Her legacy, however, extends far beyond her lifetime. She remains a symbol of Irish resistance and female power, a figure who challenged the norms of her time and carved out a place for herself in a world that was relentlessly hostile to women in positions of power. In the annals of Europe's forgotten pirate kings and queens, Grace O'Malley stands unique, not just as a pirate and a chieftain, but as an icon of resilience and defiance. Her life is a testament to the indomitable spirit of those who refuse to be defined by the circumstances of their birth or the conventions of their time. Grace of Allais, the Irish rover, remains a beacon of inspiration, her story echoing across the centuries, a reminder that the sea knows no gender, only the skill and courage of those who dare to navigate its waters. In the tempestuous saga of Europe's forgotten pirate kings, the tale of Stieg Anders and Havid, known as the Baltic Berserker, stands as a testament to the unyielding spirit of a man wronged, a noble turned outlaw waging a relentless war upon the seas. His story, set in the late 13th century, unfolds against the backdrop of the Kingdom of Denmark, a realm fraught with internal strife and royal intrigue. Stieg was born into the Danish nobility, was a man of valour and distinction, a knight in the service of King Eric V. His life, one of honour and duty, was irrevocably altered by the winds of political turmoil and personal tragedy. In the year 1286, King Eric V was mysteriously assassinated, an event that plunged the kingdom into chaos and set the stage for Stig's dramatic transformation from a loyal knight to a feared pirate. Fully accused of involvement in the king's murder, Stieg found himself the target of a ruthless political conspiracy. His lands were confiscated, his name besmirched, and he was declared an outlaw, 
forced to flee from the very kingdom he had once sworn to protect. This betrayal cut deeper than any blade, igniting in Stig a burning desire for vengeance and justice. Stripped of his titles and possessions, Stig sought refuge in the one place where the reach of the kingdom waned, the open sea. There, he gathered a band of loyal followers, fellow outcasts and seasoned seamen, and together they embarked upon a new life as pirates. They were not mere raiders. They were the avengers of Stig's honor, a formidable force united under the banner of their fallen leader. Stig's base of operations was the island of Hagelm, a rocky outcrop in the Baltic Sea. Here, he established a stronghold, a pirate haven from which he launched his raids. The Baltic Berserker, as Stig's came to be known, was a terror on the seas. His fleet, swift and deadly, struck fear into the hearts of sailors and coastal dwellers. His raids were not acts of mere pillage. They were a crusade against those who had wronged him, a relentless pursuit of retribution. With every ship captured and every coastal village raided, Stig's legend grew, transforming him into a figure of myth and dread. Yet, despite his fearsome reputation, Stig was a man of honor. His battle was not with the common folk, but with the nobility and the corrupt system that had betrayed him. Stig's war upon the seas continued for years, his name a byword for rebellion and defiance. He became a symbol of resistance. The final chapter of Stig Anderson Hevedy's saga remains shrouded in mystery. Some say he perished in a fierce naval battle, his ship going down amidst a maelstrom of arrows and fire. Others believe he eventually found peace, disappearing into the annals of history, his final fate a matter of legend and speculation. Stig Anderson Hedebid, the Baltic berserker, stands as a reminder of the fine line between nobility and outlawry, of the enduring human quest for justice and vengeance. Story, echoing through the centuries, serves as a testament to the indomitable spirit of those who refuse to be silenced, who choose instead to carve their own path in a world that seeks to constrain them. As our journey through the shadowed waters of history draws to a close, we are left to reflect on the tumultuous lives and enduring legacies of Europe's forgotten pirate kings and queen. These were not mere marauders of the sea. They were architects of their fate, rebels against an era that sought to confine them to the margins of history. In the tapestry of the past, each of these figures, from the Corsair of Calabria to the Baltic Berserker, represents a unique thread, a story of defiance, ambition, and often a quest for justice. These pirate kings and queens navigated not just the physical seas, but the turbulent waters of politics and power. They were products of their time, yet they stood apart from it, challenging the norms and conventions that sought to define them. In their daring raids, their bold leadership, and their unyielding spirit, they embodied the timeless human desire for freedom and autonomy. Their exploits and adventures, while often romanticized, were not mere tales of swashbuckling and treasure. They were complex narratives of survival, resistance, and in some cases revenge. These pirates, in challenging the might of empires and kingdoms, became symbols of resistance against oppression and injustice. They were not just outlaws of the sea. They were champions of the marginalized and the disenfranchised. As we look back upon their lives, we see more than the legacy of piracy. We see a reflection of the human condition in all its complexity. Their stories are marked by both light and shadow, by acts of bravery and instances of brutality. They remind us that history is not just a chronicle of kings and battles, but a tapestry woven from the lives of all who dared to leave their mark upon it. The echoes of these forgotten pirate kings still linger in the modern world. They can be heard in the crashing of the waves against ancient castle walls, in the songs of the sea that tell of their exploits, and in the silent watch of the ruins that once were their homes and strongholds. Their legacy is not just in the gold they sought or the ships they captured, but in the indelible imprint they left on the narrative of history. As we sail away from the shores of the past, we carry with us the stories of these remarkable men and women. In their lives, we find the strands of courage, resilience, and the unquenchable human thirst for freedom. They remind us that the seas were once a realm of endless possibility, 
where the marginalized could become monarchs of their destiny and where the rules of the land did not apply. In the grand saga of Europe's past, the tales of its pirate kings and queens stand as a testament to the enduring allure of the sea, a world apart, where the constraints of society gave way to the freedom of the open waves. Their stories, though rooted in a time long past, continue to inspire and captivate, a reminder of the timeless call of the sea and the human spirit that dares to answer it. As the sun sets on our journey, we bid farewell to these rulers of the forgotten waves, their flags no longer seen, but their legends forever etched in the annals of time. They were the black flags over the old world, the shadows that danced upon the waters of history, their legacy were as enduring as the tides. Thank you for joining us on this enchanting journey through medieval history. While our weekly episodes will continue to captivate your imagination, there's an exclusive treasure trove for subscribers. A secret vault of bonus episodes filled with extra tales and deep dives into the subjects we cover. Your curiosity fuels our mission and we're truly thankful for your support. Until we meet again among stone walls and towering turrets, keep that torch of curiosity burning bright. Thank you for listening.